All right, so why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and kind of your background. Okay, my name is John Prados. I'm an author and uh, analyst of international security and intelligence issues. I'm a senior analyst with the National Security Archive in Washington that specializes in declassified government documents. I'm the author of uh, more than 12 books, many of which deal with intelligence and or national security issues. Most recent one of those books is titled Hoodwinked, and it covers the run-up to the Iraq War and shows how the Bush administration essentially constructed uh, a theory or a story of how Saddam Hussein was an international threat and needed to be destroyed by the United States and coalition invasion. And so I think and now we see a lot of blame that the administration is putting on the CIA. Can you kind of put that into context from a lot of the documents that you've seen over the years and the shifts that you've seen? Yes, I think that the CIA certainly does bear some blame in the sense that it uh, talked about weapons that did not exist. It assessed that weapons existed where they did not. It relied on assumptions instead of data for a lot of what it reported on Iraq. But the Bush administration has a larger aim in uh, looking at what happened in Iraq as an intelligence failure. And its aim is to escape the political responsibility for its own actions in the pre-war period, during which it was constructing a certain image of an alleged Iraqi threat that needed to be countered by United States action. And when you look at the, the television news media, how they covered um, this buildup, how would you evaluate both the print and television news media leading up to the war in Iraq? I would say that there were individual instances of very forthright reporting where certain reporters went out and attempted to get to the bottom of allegations that were made. But to a much greater degree, uh, uh, corporate reporting, if you want to call it that, uh, the large array of media, the broad swath, uh, uh, took the administration line and reported it as fact. And I think that had to do partly with their concerns about their image with American people, in which it's often reported and polls frequently say that the media has little credibility, so they could gain credibility this way. And also because of their concerns on access, administration officials are the source for much news that gets reported. Their access was threatened by taking a line that uh, differed from what they were being told by administration officials. So over the broad swath, I think that the media went along with the administration to a considerable degree. I would say probably that the print media was less guilty of this than the, uh, the broadcast media, but in general I think that problem applied across the board. And when you look at, can you speak to um, how a lot of journalism is uh, event-based, like uh, news of the day, as opposed to looking at the public record, and what type of insights have you gained from looking at a long-term public record? I think that's exactly right. And, and I I'm, think that uh, I'm not going to include my questions. I understand. Like that, so. I think it's exactly right that uh, because m journalism reports day-to-day -day events, there's a very small premium attached to looking at historical records and keeping track of broad sets of events over a period of time. And this, I think, contributed to a great degree to the media's inability to realize that it was being taken for a ride by the administration. Because not having looked at the historical record, they were unable to tell when they were being fed a line of goods. For example, there were uh, CIA reports all through the 1990s already in the public domain because they were declassified and had been declassified as a result of the controversy over Gulf War Syndrome, uh, a medical uh, consequence of the 1990-1991 war, um, which detailed a good range of uh, the government's data 
on uh, Iraqi weapons of mass destruction programs. And in fact, now in the, in the uh, follow-up to the Iraq war, where the Senate Intelligence Committee has just released a report detailing what intelligence was used in, by the CIA itself, by the Bush administration, in explaining the Iraqi threat, uh, that report shows that uh, some of these same, this same material furnished a, a, a good fraction of the material that they were in fact using in compiling their data. When administration officials then came forward with claims that were more extreme than the data uh, substantiated, uh, media didn't look at these historical records or, or this uh, material that was available in the public record, but simply took the claims that were being uh, advanced by administration officials. And when you make, can you make a distinction between the European governments, the European media, and their perspective on this whole diplomatic battle leading up to the war in Iraq? Were they, did they look at this historical record a little bit more? Or can you talk about that, kind of the international perspective? I think the international perspective is an interesting one. There was, uh, there were a number of countries that went along with the United States in the so-called coalition in the Iraqi war. And uh, if you look at those countries, uh, the principal ones are uh, the United Kingdom and Australia were the two largest allies in the war. Uh, both the United Kingdom and Australia uh, have intelligence liaison relationships with the United States. And both the United Kingdom and Australia derived a, a large amount of their information from the CIA and the U.S. intelligence community. Now you look at those countries, their uh, medias were not so receptive uh, to their government's claims about what was going on in Iraq. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how this bears on the credibility of media question that we discussed a little while ago, because I don't know enough about how media are um, um, held in regard by the, the people of Australia and uh, uh, the United Kingdom. But nevertheless, there was a much more active questioning and um, uh, doubting of uh, government claims in both those countries. And if you go further afield to countries that were less reliant on CIA intelligence reporting, places like France and Germany, in those countries both the intelligence services and the media did not go so far as the American media and the American intelligence service in portraying an Iraqi threat. So in other words, did you see that, <coughs> that the U.S. media was uh, asserting as fact uh, claims that they did have weapons of mass destruction when they did in fact not, or, I mean when they should have said you know, allegations and such? Or? I think there were instances in which the United States media in the United States asserted as fact allegations that were mean, being made about Iraq, but uh, that's a certain fraction of the whole. I think a larger element uh, in the explication is that they repeated and repeated again in press stories day after day allegations that were not substantiated by the administration and that act of repetition had an impact in making people think of these allegations as facts. And uh, can you speak to this whole body of, of uh, you know, information that the UN had had over the, the uh, 10 years and you know, how did that play into uh, a lot of these um, from how did the CIA and administration incorporate or fail to incorporate a lot of that information? There was a second stream of information in addition to the CIA's own reporting from the 1990s, and that was the reporting from the United Nations uh, disarmament commissions that uh, uh, were in Iraq from 1991 to 1998 and that returned to Iraq in the end of 2002 and up to the period just prior to the war when the war began. Uh, this was a large body of material to which the United States had complete access. As a matter of fact, uh, 
American intelligence services helped the United Nations weapons inspectors with information, helping them to find and target, if you will, if that's the right word, uh, Iraqi sites to go inspect and uh, destroy anything that they found at those places. Uh, that material from 1991 to 1998 uh, provides a record of large amounts of Iraqi materials and weapons and weapons precursors that were destroyed as well as uh, a set of um, indications that some Iraqi resources uh, could not be documented, could, their, their destruction could not be documented, they were so-called unaccounted for. Um, we took in the run-up to the Gulf War, all the indications of things that could not be accounted for and assumed that those were weapons in an Iraqi arsenal. And we discounted the evidence of uh, the United Nations inspectors where they had uh, reports that Iraq had issued this or that order to dismantle weapons programs, to dismantle their arsenal to take away arms caches. Uh, in the second period, the period just before the Gulf War, when inspectors were sent back in again, we furnished um, reluctant, we, f we gave reluctant cooperation to the inspectors in terms of helping them with data that would help them find things. I would argue because the Bush administration needed to avoid a United Nations judgment that Iraq had in fact disarmed its arsenal of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and at the same time, when the United Nations weapons inspectors went in there and then produced a series of reports on their progress in disarming the Iraqi arsenal, the U.S. intelligence treated those reports as objects to be refuted rather than new data that could be incorporated into an objective analysis of the Iraqi suite of weapons of mass destruction. And during the build-up, uh, I think in, in August 26, you know, Dick Cheney made a big speech, and then from there they seemed to unroll a lot of this uh, public relations campaign, really. At, at what point did you kind of realize that something was not right, that something didn't, from what you've seen from the historical record didn't seem to add up, and, and at what point did you become suspicious? Or it may have been even before that point. You're talking me, me personally in right. terms of, uh, or what I discovered afterwards. I think that personally, uh, it was in the summer of 2002, looking at the um, sort of sequence of claims about Iraq, that I began to be uh, aware, really, that something was going on here. And it was at that point when I started to pay um, real attention to the sequence of charges and uh, uh, allegations that were coming out of the Bush administration that I began to realize that this uh, was different from what I remembered of the 1990s because during the process of the United Nations weapons inspections I had followed this story. And I had seen, at that time, there were various uh, controversies about this or that Iraqi program that had not been dismantled or had been dismantled and so on, about Iraqi efforts to uh, hide weapons from inspectors and so on. But there was also a solid record of United Nations achievement in terms of disarming the Iraqi weapons. Their entire chemical infrastructure had been taken down. Their uh, biological weapons program infrastructure had been taken down. Iraq uh, lacked, by 1998, any facility with a negative atmosphere, um, or I should say a positive atmosphere, uh, isolation and containment that would enable it to work with germs without killing people, for example. Um, and uh, there was the whole business about uh, the chief of the Iraqi weapons program who had defected and then told the United Nations inspectors that, in fact, um, orders had been given by Saddam to dismantle their programs. Now, you will find, if you look into the Bush administration's reporting before the Iraq war, that that individual, Hussein Kamil, 
is referred to on a number of occasions, but every single time he's referred to in context where he said there was something, and never is he referred to in context where he was telling the United Nations and through them the CIA that Iraq had dismantled this or that thing. And so do you, uh, I think you had made a point in the atomic, or Bolton of atomic scientists that, you know, saying Kamal that he was making these claims, but it, when you look at the public record, you had actually seen that their reporting had actually, you know, there is a question of what real uh, evidence did Hussein Kamel give. You know, they were saying, the administration was trying to say, we only can find stuff through these defectors and these people who defect, but is that, is that in fact true? Do they actually know that already? Um, give me that question again. So if you look at the Bush administration's claim that Hussein Kamel, that you can only find information from defectors. And you look at some of the declassified documents from the Gulf War syndrome uh, release, do you see evidence that they actually knew a lot of this information already? Um, yes, there are two points here actually. First, let me say this about uh, the question of defectors. Um, one of the interesting aspects about this question of defectors is that even there, there is a bifurcation. That is to say, if the Bush administration was getting information from defectors, why is it that the information from Hussein Kamel is only admissible in its uh, threatening aspects? whereas the information from the Iraqi National Congress people and those other defectors that were brought forward by Ahmed Shalabi is totally admissible. In other words, the Bush administration even itself was, was uh, playing games with what material they were going to use. They were picking and choosing among the reporting that they were getting and presenting those things that were threatening and not presenting the things that were not. Now, uh, on your second uh, question, it is the case that the CIA reporting from the 1990s contains uh, human intelligence reports from people who were Iraqi officials and officers during the Gulf War and right after the Gulf War, presumably some of these things from prisoner interrogation and some of them from uh, uh, contacts between United Nations weapons inspectors and Iraqi officials that they were talking about that furnish information which uh, contradicts some of the reports that uh, were given to the, UN, to the U.S. by uh, defectors that were brought forward by Ahmed Chalabi and Alawi and the various Iraqi uh, emigre groups. So yes, those contradictions are in the record. And. Um did you see a, a pattern of the uh, Bush administration trying to discredit weapons inspections process, and what, and how does that, you know, that claim that weapons inspectors or inspections are totally worthless? How does that claim stack up? I think the assertion that the weapons inspections were totally worthless was contrived by the Bush administration as a means of advancing its interpretation of the Iraqi threat and therefore the necessity, the necessity for invading Iraq. The United Nations weapons inspectors did a great deal of work. They visited the relevant sites. Uh, they were denied information by U.S. intelligence. Uh, I would submit for um, the purpose of the United States then being able to claim that the weapons inspections were not comprehensive and were not working. And then when the United Nations weapons inspectors filed their reports before the United Nations Security Council, uh, the CIA and U.S. intelligence treated those reports as uh, charges that needed to be refuted uh, uh, and in fact, we made use of those reports in exactly the sort of manipulative way that we use the data from, inf from defectors and uh, agents. For example, uh, Hans Blix gave, uh, no, I take that back. For example, Mohamed Baradei, uh, the chief of the, of the International Atomic Energy Agency, gave a major presentation before the Security Council on January 27, 2003, 
in which he presented a conclusion, which he called his conclusion, that uh, they had found no evidence of an Iraqi nuclear program or that could substantiate an Iraqi nuclear program. Uh, and then, only about 10 days later, the American Secretary of State Colin Powell gave a briefing before the same body in which he asserted that uh, uh, Mohammed el Baradei's conclusions in his report supported the United States position that there was an Iraqi nuclear program that was far advanced. Okay, and when you look at the situation now, it seems like everything's being framed that this decision after the congressional vote in, in October, that, you know, that was it. And in, you know, they, in a way, seem to disregard any sort of contradictory evidence that was pouring in over that time period up until before the war. Uh, do you, can you comment on that? Do you see that as well? Or, um, I think what we have going on now is uh, an effort to change the ground, you know. Uh, we'll talk about Iraq as an intelligence failure. Uh, George Bush is not responsible because he was given the wrong information, whereas prior to the war, George Bush was pushing the intelligence agencies to give him the information he needed so he could push the war. Um, now we'll talk about this as some kind of technical intelligence failure, and we'll shift the ground to talk about how much better Iraqis are today are off today than they were under Saddam Hussein. Now, uh, it's debatable whether in fact Iraqis are better off today than during the time of Saddam Hussein for various reasons that have to do with their electricity supply and uh, the level of unemployment in Iraq and uh, the uh, infrastructure, the destroyed infrastructure of the Iraqi economy. Uh, but again, the administration isn't talking about those factors. It's trying to focus solely on the question of the government of uh, Iraq and this notion that uh, it got into the war because of some misguided intelligence failure. And did you see that they were not really, as you said before, listening to the uh, weapons inspector's results? They were trying to just, uh, in a way, use it as a, a pretext? Did you see that the, that the United States was merely using this uh, multilateral agency to get kind of a, a approval to go to war? I think the United States was attempting to use the multilateral agency, uh, the United Nations agencies, as well as the United Nations itself, as uh, legitimizing mechanisms for its enterprise of conducting a war against Saddam Hussein. This was going to be the preventive war. This was going to be the action that established the so-called Bush Doctrine uh, and was going to become the basis for an American policy so-called of counter-proliferation, which offered the same kinds of uh, threats of American actions to other countries that refused to hew an American line on uh, what we said in foreign policy. Okay. And um, when, during the build-up to the war in Iraq, did, was there any point when the, the mainstream, or corporate, or alternative media came to you as uh, to speak uh, as an expert on this issue? Or, you know, is, um, I gave uh, I gave a certain number of interviews before the war. Uh, I wouldn't say that any of them were with mainstream media. They were with public media or individual radio stations mostly, but not with uh, mainstream media. Did you try to, to reach out to them to, to, um, to say... I hey, was not making a special effort to reach out to them. Okay. But I was out there. I had pieces that you saw, certainly, and anyone else could have seen. Okay. I had a good deal of interest, actually, from European media. Several times, uh, BBC, uh, for example, uh, but never once ABC or CBS or, um, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. And um, from your sense of, you know, looking at, at everything, you know, why did the United States go to war in Iraq? That's the $64 question. Why did the United States go to war with Iraq? Uh, right now, I favor the interpretation that uh, the so-called neoconservatives in the Bush administration had a vision of transforming the Middle East uh, 
and um, a vision really that flowed out of the Gulf War of 1991. After that war, you saw some progress in the um, Arab-Israeli situation as a result of uh, agreements on negotiation that were made in Oslo and in Madrid. And a lot of the analysis at that time, I'm talking now about 1991 to 93 period, was that the reason this was happening was because of what had happened in the Persian Gulf and this huge coalition that had come together and the fact that uh, Arab and Western countries had all united around a set of goals. Um, and there was some idea, I think, in the Bush administration that that could be replicated and that in the act of replicating that they could also uh, change some of the other political problems that they had, such as the uh, discomfort of having American forces in Saudi Arabia. They could be shifted out and put somewhere else. Um, and the, uh, the whole uh, issue of uh, oil exports from the Middle East. So they had sort of this idea that by doing this one thing they could solve many problems. In addition to uh, um, entrenching this new Bush doctrine of preemption and preventive war. Okay, and let's see. Um, you talk a little bit about in um, this article here as um, February 5th as being a point of departure. Can you speak to that under the, the power presentation? I think the the key political problem that the Bush administration faced at the end of 2002 and going into 2003 was that it was not getting the kind of international support. It wasn't getting the kind of uh, co uh, coalescence of a coalition that had happened before the Gulf War in 1991. It had in hand a congressional resolution which said that um, the United States is authorized to use force based on an international commitment by the United Nations to enforce UN resolutions on disarming Iraq. Um, and it had in hand a United Nations resolution that said that uh, we may make a decision in a further resolution about going to war with Iraq. For those reasons, um, the real political situation was that the United States wasn't in a position to go to war with Iraq uh, absent further international action, and that required building some kind of an international consensus for a war with Iraq. Uh, the consequences of that were palpable. They were that the United States had to avoid um, any judgment by United Nations weapons inspectors that Iraq had disarmed because that would void the United Nations resolutions, the Security Council resolutions that the United States was supposed to be enforcing in taking this military action. And the United States had to do something to bring about this international uh, consensus that would permit the Security Council to pass a further resolution that would complete the authorization for war that Bush needed. For those reasons, the Powell speech uh, on February 5th, 2003 was crucial, the, the crucial diplomatic play in laying the groundwork for attempting this second United Nations Security Council resolution, which, however, the United States failed to obtain. And uh, what was the reaction? Uh, did you see a difference from the reaction within the American public and press versus the international public opinion and press of that speech? I think there was a very definite difference in terms of reactions to the Powell speech. Uh, the American media, f in large part, reported the Powell speech as some kind, as a kind of a uh, uh, breakthrough a breakthrough in terms of uh, the diplomacy of preparing for war and a breakthrough in terms of uh, intelligence transparency. They were going to move forward and reveal so much in this that no one could have any question anymore about Saddam Hussein's uh, alleged weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Powell gave his speech. Uh, 
the same day, um, if you looked at interviews with the Chinese foreign minister, the French foreign minister, the Syrian foreign minister, uh, the German representatives um, at the United Nations who had listened to these, that speech, all of them raised questions about it. The British press was not especially receptive to the Powell speech. The French and German presses also reported it negatively. Uh, the Spanish foreign minister was positive, as was the British, but both the Spanish and the British were our diplomatic uh, allies in this process of, of trying to obtain an additional United Nations Security Council resolution. And I think another uh, key point that I see is on the March 7th, uh, you have these doubts that were coming out from El Baradai, but at the same time, the, the Bush administration had given this you know, arbitrary 10-day deadline, and so virtually none of that information uh, was transmitted. Can you speak to what type of revelations came forth on March 7th from El Baradai? I think on March the 7th, reporting to the Security Council, Mohammed el Baradei of the IAEA, uh, identified a process uh, that his group had gone through, which had in fact established that uh, uh, Iraq lacked the nuclear program that the United States was saying. Uh, uh, the United States proceeded to say that el Baradei's materials were incomplete, but that it couldn't wait any longer for a resolution and established an arbitrary limit. And uh, after 10 days, the United States issued an ultimatum and actually started the war 48 hours after that. And uh, when you say arbitrary deadline, I think there's some confusion even within the mainstream press as to how long these resolutions would go on. And uh, I don't know if, you're, if you can speak to like resolution 1384 and 1441 as, as to what the exact timeline was according to the UN versus what the administration was saying it was. That's a good question. I'm not sure I can speak to that. If I remember correctly, 1441 it had a 120-day deadline, did it not? Well, and 120 days would make it... Um, middle of February. But then there was an extension that was approved uh, in the middle of February, was there not? It was a 90-day uh, extension? Hans Blick's, Blick's book, and I think what happened, and this is something that wasn't really covered in the mainstream media, so it is very difficult even for us to really know what really happened, but uh, I think in uh, January they said, well, let's just fall back to what created UNSCOM, you know, this resolution that created UNSCOM as to be, or uh, Amovic as different from being from UNSCOM. Uh -huh. So they kind of fell back on those reporting deadlines. But uh, from my reading, I didn't see that there was any set date uh, that was going to uh, stop the inspections, it was going to go on. Well, that's certainly and true so, in the in the UNMOVIC uh, resolution, but so I'm afraid I can't speak to that in detail. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's see, I haven't talked to anyone else that has looked at this as much as you, so. Uh, let's see. Um, as, uh, you speak to, you know, you know, the nuclear, chemical, and biological, you know, claims the administration that was making, and let's start with you know, the, some of the stuff that the administration was saying versus um, what was coming out in the, in, the, in the public record. There seemed to be shifts in the CIA reporting and of the threats, I think you, you had pointed out. Um, I think that the... I think there was a, a certain amount of a struggle within the U.S. intelligence community about its reporting on Iraq. The uh, people who specialized in different sort of areas of the dinosaur, different parts of the dinosaur, had different things to say. And there were definite um, disputes between uh, the CIA and other United States intelligence agencies on certain issues. One of them was the Iraqi nuclear program. Uh, the Iraqi nuclear program, according to some analysts within the CIA, was uh, far advanced enough to make use of these aluminum tubes that Iraq was attempting to procure uh, as 
uh, parts of um, um, centrifuge machines that would uh, distill and enrich uranium so that it could be used in nuclear weapons. There were major differences between the CIA and the Department of Energy and the State Department about uh, whether in fact this was the case. The main CIA analyst who was working on this, who was working this issue, didn't in fact have the expertise to make the claims that he was making, yet he was backed by agency uh, superiors in the arguments that ranged back and forth about these matters within the intelligence community. If you look now at the report recently issued by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence on the pre-war intelligence about Iraq, you will see that this debate about the aluminum tubes actually went back uh, to at least the end of the Clinton administration in a series of reports that went back and forth uh, between the Central Intelligence Agency and the Department of Energy prim primarily with the State Department sort of being on the sidelines. But the Department of Energy provided quite explicit and very concrete reports explaining why um, this claim that the aluminum tubes were, were nuclear program items could not be true and why in fact another alternative explanation of these tubes, i.e. that they were uh, pieces of artillery rockets, was in fact the probable uh, um, uh, role for those uh, items. On chemical weapons now, there was a different set of um, concerns among the agencies. And uh, people in the CIA um, had little evidence, in fact, for a number of the assertions they made, including that Saddam had a stockpile of active chemical weapons, that uh, there was uh, production of chemical weapons going on in Iraq, that the Iraqis had uh, upgraded and expanded their chemical program for the specific purpose of conducting a chemical weapons program, uh, and that uh, they were ready to deliver chemical weapons. There was almost no concrete evidence for any of those assertions, uh, and that was verified by the, the report of the Senate Intelligence Committee after the war. Um, the CIA, in running up to the war, uh, did an ele an, uh, a section on chemical weapons programs in its national intelligence estimate and relied on uh, reporting from a different U.S. agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, to sort of get around some of these objections because DIA had, had previously a more restrained view of the chemical weapons situation. And a similar kind of problem uh, occurred with the biological weapons claims um, that were uh, roiling back and forth within the intelligence community. In fact, we had very little evidence for Iraqi biological efforts. We did have evidence from the United Nations weapons inspections of the 1990s that the Iraqi laboratories and infrastructure had in fact been dismantled. Um, and we had a certain amount of evidence that some Iraqi plants were being uh, upgraded and put back online, including with fermentation units and so on. But uh, at the same time, uh, there had been outbreaks of foot and mouth disease in Iraq in the year 2000 and afterwards, and Iraq had started an active vaccination program. Now, um, the Iraqis needed vaccine to implement a vaccination program in their country. Uh, the United States government made the claim that Iraq, that, that this action with the Iraqi uh, chemical, uh, sorry, biological plants was unnecessary, could only be explained by a biological weapons program because they could buy all the vaccine they needed through the United Nations Food for Peace program. The Bush administration did not say that the United States had routinely vetoed every effort by Iraq to buy uh, vaccine through the United Nations Food for uh, Food for uh, Oil Program. Um, so 
there were games going on with how to portray uh, the development of Iraqi biological industries. And when it came time to present this to the American public in the form of that CIA white paper, in fact, this Iraqi biological plant was uh, uh, held up as an example of um, Iraq's push for a so-called biological weapons program. Similarly, with the question of these mobile, uh, the alleged, I should say, mobile biological weapons laboratories, uh, the evidence for those was exceedingly skimpy. A lot of it was uh, open to question. The purveyors of the evidence themselves, some of them were labeled as fabricators, and that essentially did not make any difference to the drafters of the National Intelligence Estimate who went ahead to put this in as an active piece, quote unquote, of a of a, an Iraqi weapons program. Yeah, I want to kind of ask some um, more more details of the timing of the National Intelligence Estimate. It seems that you know a lot of these claims were being made, and then it you know it took a call from uh, Congress. I think it was Dick Durbin on September twelfth, and it was three weeks after that. And all those claims that were being made in that meantime had already seemed to be starting. So can you? Speak to uh, the National Intelligence Estimate and who usually even requests it. National Intelligence Estimates are usually uh, the product of uh, one of three uh, avenues. One of them is the President requests a National Intelligence Estimate or his National Security Council in his name requests a National Intelligence Estimate. The second is the CIA has a program of NIEs that it produces uh, sort of semi-automatically. For example, every year there used to be a Russian estimate, you know, an estimate about what the Soviet Union was up to. So there's a regular schedule of estimates that are more or less automatically produced. And then an estimate can be requested by uh, another cabinet level official in the United States government. The Secretary of Defense, for example, might request an estimate on whether uh, the political stability in the various successor states to Russia is going to impinge on his programs for emplacing American forces, you know, just as a hypothetical, right? So those are the usual avenues. It's uh, almost unheard of for a National Intelligence Estimate to come from a request by the Congress. It, can you speak to, uh, you know, what it seems like a very suspicious that none of the uh, administration, uh, any of those three avenues, were requesting a national intelligence estimate on Iraq. And it wasn't until the Democrats in Congress really pushed for it. So can you speak to that? I think this is um, actually symptomatic of the uh, question of uh, what was the purpose here. What was the purpose of the whole issue of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction in American politics? I think that the purpose of raising this to the level of a political issue to the, was to make Americans afraid and make them unite behind a project to attack Iraq. For that reason, uh, the Bush administration wanted essentially to have a clear field to make whatever allegations about Iraq it wished to do. Consequently, the Bush administration did not want a national intelligence estimate about Iraq because that estimate might come out with conclusions that undercut charges that it was making about the threat from Saddam Hussein. So. Uh, unlike the usual role of national intelligence estimates. Oh, it's still, we'll, we'll okay. do it in a second. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. Unlike the, um, in a sort of an ideal uh, vision of American governmental process, you know, if you were considering going to war with the country, you would ask for a national intelligence estimate because you wanted to know about that country's forces, you wanted to know about its ability to stop you, you wanted to be able to plan against those forces in creating your military plans for a war. I think in the case of Iraq, 
uh, the Bush administration had a clear sense that it could defeat whatever Iraqi military forces were in the field. So it did not feel it needed a national intelligence estimate for that purpose. And it did feel that a national intelligence estimate might undercut some of the claims that administration officials were making about the Iraqi threat. Okay. Let me just uh, hook this up real quick and I have about five minutes for more questions. Is that okay? All right. Now, it seems, you know, just from a lot of the, the claims that were being made, it's simple flaws of critical thinking, in a way, of uh, making assertions. Can you speak to what sort of claims that the administration was making that just didn't hold up to pure critical thinking? Uh, I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Too many. Well, I, I mean, one that some of that I think of uh, uh, correlation causation. You know, just because two things are linked doesn't mean they're collaboratively linked. Uh, with Al Qaeda and, and Iraq, uh, another one could be. That's true. Okay. Um, yes, there was a, a, a. There were cases in the administration's arguments in which uh, one thing didn't even lead to another thing. Uh, for example, the situation with. Uh, allegations that there was an alliance between Saddam Hussein and al-Qaeda. Uh, in fact, what you had was a set of fairly limited intelligence reporting through the 1990s, uh, some of it from uh, other governments that, were, that had an interest in influencing the United States, some of it from uh, defector sources, some of whom had been in fact la labeled as fabricators, and some of it from um, uh, foreign services, uh, all of which added up to very little, but permitted them to assert that there had been a series of meetings and a set of other events, and indeed those meetings uh, and events may have taken place. But there's a leap between to saying that such and such a meeting or such and such an event took place and saying there is an alliance between Saddam Hussein and al-Qaeda. And we never had evidence to bridge that gap. We were making a logical leap when we uh, asserted, based on this limited evidence, that there was that kind of a relationship. Uh, I think that same kind of error occurred in other places. Uh, also, the aluminum tubes in the Iraqi nuclear program is an example of that. Even if these aluminum tubes, which we're now pretty sure had nothing to do with Iraqi nuclear weapons, but even if they had, that didn't add up to an advanced Iraqi nuclear program that was going to yield a nuclear weapon in the, in the near term that was going to be a threat to the Middle East and the United States, which is the way that George Bush put it. Uh, so there were a number of instances of that kind of thinking in the Iraq uh, estimates. And it, another thing I see is kind of uh, assumptions, you know, starting with assumptions and piling on and not checking assumptions and having alternative competing hypotheses in a way. Oh, that's absolutely right. The, uh, one of the major conclusions of the Senate Intelligence Committee report is that there was what they called an assumptions train. that. The CIA and other intelligence agencies had uh, taken assumptions about what was going on with Iraq. Uh, and then, uh, as they did further reports down the line, they went back to the old reports based on assumptions. They made new assumptions, uh, and in each, each iteration made the reporting another step removed from reality. Uh, and I would say that's true. Uh, in general, but it's also true specifically that we used, we replaced data with assumptions in any number of situations. For example, the idea that there was a secret, hidden Iraqi force of long range missiles that was about to be launched against Tel Aviv or Riyadh or other targets in the Middle East. That notion that there was this secret force was based on just uh, a few people saying uh, 
that they'd seen a rocket this place or that place, or they'd seen some parts for rockets, and the fact that the United Nations weapons inspectors in the 1990s had not been able to account for a couple of missiles that the Iraqis had bought from uh, uh, the Soviet Union, and some missiles that the Iraqis had built in Iran, some knockoff model copies. Um, and all of a sudden there was a covert missile force. There was no evidence that there was uh, units, uh, you know, running such a force, that there was, uh, there were facilities for such a force, that, there were op these, that this force was operating. No concrete evidence of this force whatsoever. But the assumption was, based on this accounting difference, that there was this force. So there are a number of examples of that. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that drove those assumptions is the behavior of Saddam Hussein. So when you look in hindsight, can you kind of put that into, into context as to, you know, these assumptions being driven by this behavior and why was he behaving like that? I'm not sure that we will ever have an explanation for what Saddam Hussein was thinking as the year 2002 went into 2003 and then the war began. I think it is clearly the case that Saddam's um, reluctance to confront this rising American anger um, and his uh, inability to bring himself to really open uh, Iraq to the weapons inspections that might have defused the American uh, claims, uh, his refusal to do that really uh, set him up for what happened to him subsequently. I think that that's a, a, Saddam's behavior is a major question mark in the whole Iraqi business. I don't really have an explanation for it that's a good one. Um, uh, one hypothesis is that Saddam was uh, posturing himself within a regional political and international context that uh, by maintaining this ambiguity of whether there were Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. He was obliging leaders of neighboring states to deal with him as if he had weapons of mass destruction. So that consequently he would be reluctant to give up this uh, deception, if that's what it was. But if that's what it was, it was in fact an Iraqi deception, because Iraq did not have uh, substantial uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, force. And, you know, back in 1998, and um, some report from uh, Scott Ritter is that a lot of UNSCOM was infiltrated by uh, intelligence agents. And, and, and I think I see in some ways, you know, smoking guns even, you know, saying the CIA, saying our human, in, you know, human intelligence sources within Iraq dried up after 98. So can you speak to you know, uh, was that a factor of the American espionage? It was certainly a factor that human intelligence sources for the CIA dried up in Iraq after 1998. Uh, the uh, information we have is that there are only a handful of sources, human sources that is, reporting from Iraq for the CIA after 1998. I think the number four has been used. and. Uh, it's been said that not a single one of those sources was reporting on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. None of them were associated with the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction programs. Uh, the Brits, the British intelligence, had only a handful of Iraqi sources. Um, and both American and British streams of reporting, uh, it's not clear to this day how, to what degree they were in fact getting reporting from the same people. So uh, uh, the human intelligence sources for both countries were very, very, very extremely limited. Uh, and do you see that there was... That's it. We're out of time. Thanks. Great.